Now, I joined the Army on August 28, 2006, with the goal of furthering myself, bettering myself, um, getting a stable career and a stable future under my belt, and was prepared to fight for my country in any circumstance. I thought the war in Iraq was just. I thought that we were there for a good reason. I considered September 11th to be um, a day of, of um, a tragedy that, that had to be um, countered. And I thought that fighting in the Middle East was the answer to, uh, to that. So I signed up and went to basic training at Fort Benning, Georgia. Everything was fine. And uh, reported to my first unit, which was the 4th Infantry Division, 167 Armored. And I uh, reported to duty and was pretty pumped up about what I was doing. I was prepared to train for going to Iraq. Well, after a couple weeks of being there and listening to some of the veterans who'd been to Iraq, I had a severe change of conscience and heart and decided that I would apply for conscientious objector status based on my belief that I could not fight in the current war and uh, was laughed at and scoffed at, so I came to Canada. So I would like to now focus on my attitude that I had towards the military before I joined the military and the attitude that I had when I came out of the military or you know, when I changed my mind. When I first joined up, I had a strong bearing on my family history. And I knew that my family had served courageously in many wars for the United States ever since the American Revolution. And I knew the stories of all my ancestors who had fought in the wars. I, I had pictures, I had medals, I had letters from all these wars. And I knew that it was in my blood to go fight for my country as my ancestors had done before me. And my grandfather, both my grandfathers um, had served in Korea and Vietnam. One served in both wars and uh, was highly decorated and finished a military career as an E-9 in the U.S. Army. So that had a very strong influence on what I would do with my life. I, I saw him as a hero. I regarded him as, um, as being a very... Um, well, almost perfect in my mind at the time. And uh, I wanted to pursue what he had done in his life to honor him. Um, I knew that if I did that, that my family would definitely be proud of me. And that was really important in my mind, was to make my family proud of me because I had made some unwise choices as a teenager. Also, I, I, had a, a, I glorified everything military when I was growing up. Possibly because of the stories I heard from my grandfathers and my uncles, and um, or it could have been just a fix in my own mind. Uh, but I I loved watching war movies and playing with soldiers when I was little, and uh, read military history all throughout my childhood. I had an image of of a glorification and romanticism about the U.S. military. I thought that it was uh, a very stand up and and go forth, spread democracy throughout the world, and that we were going to save lives. Uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest, uh, Robert E. Lee, and Thomas Jackson were my three um, most revered people, and I constantly read about their lives growing up and, and uh, tried to follow their lead in the decisions I made. So it was just a natural choice to go with the military. Um, saw so honor in it. And, and the, the whole um, patriot image of, of men dying for the Constitution, dying for the United States government, and selflessly giving themselves for their country. I saw that it was a chance to really uh, fight for something and believe in it, and if needed, give my life for the cause. When they offered me the, the career package, um, the $10,000 as a signing bonus, the $37,000 is uh, from the Montgomery GI Bill, and being a, a, a universal health care, being a young man in Kentucky at the time, trying to live life on a minimum wage job is pretty tough. Seeing that I had nothing to, nothing really to turn to in the way of disagreeing with the cause, I signed up eagerly.
But once I was in the military, I saw what the real truth, the underlying truth was. I was one day sitting at a table, a smoking table, it was our break table, and I was overhearing a few sergeants and COs talking about what they had experienced in Iraq. And I thought they were telling jokes at first because I just heard these guys all laughing. So I went a little closer to find out what they were all laughing about because, hey, I needed a good laugh. And um, they were laughing about the, the murders of innocent people. They were laughing about um, raiding houses and, and getting people out of bed in their underwear. And they were laughing about how Bradley Tanks ran over a kid one time. Uh, a sergeant told me about his first kill in Iraq. Well, there's an old man walking down an alley, and he stopped him. They were on patrol, and he stopped him. He said, what are you doing? It's after curfew. You're not supposed to be out. The man said, well, I'm a doctor. I've been called. There's a lady having a baby. I'm going to deliver this child. And he shot him right there uh, because he suspected him of being a terrorist. Um, now, I would encourage everyone to go to antiwar.com. It's a website that posts for every day the casualties that occur in Iraq. And today I was looking and it said five U.S. soldiers dead and over 60 Iraqis dead. And over 138 wounded or injured due to combat. Now, how can you tell me that every single one of those casualties was a terrorist? You know, if you add up the deaths that have happened in Iraq, that means the terrorist army is, well, 1.3 million people. So, immediately I knew that what was going on was was bullshit. We we weren't over there fighting terrorists and, and and jihadis that are trying to behead everyone that, that disagrees with them. We weren't over there trying to spread democracy to a to a imprisoned country. We weren't over there trying to find weapons of mass destruction. We were over there because as a nation we are ultimately greedy. And when I heard that these stories of combat and these stories of, of atrocities, I knew immediately that this war was, was crap. Also, I noticed a certain amount of callousness and hate in these men. And I saw that all these men were combat veterans, well, supposedly combat veterans. They said, well, they'd been shot at, so they got a little combat badge. Um, and they, how they came back, I can only imagine how they were before. I didn't know them before, but the men that I saw coming back were calloused, hateful, disgusted with the Iraqi people in their own minds. They saw the Iraq as a big trash heap. And I heard them refer to Iraqis as cockroaches, you know? It was like stomping at another cockroach. They no longer saw a value in human life. They saw an Iraqi life as being less equal than an American life. And that's the way the United States has been following this war. They, they see an Iraqi life as being less than an American life. You have an American soldier killed, his, his photograph is put on TV, you know, every night on the 5 o'clock news, and there's a, silent, there's a moment of silence for all the fallen troops. But what about all these fallen Iraqi civilians? Why is a Blackwater operative um, get drunk and murder an Iraqi uh, guard and the price that he has to pay is he has to buy his own plane ticket back to the United States. You know, he committed a murder, but yet he's not punished for a murder because it's an Iraqi life, not an American. And the attitude on, I, I know tonight we're going to focus on bases, especially in Europe, and how they are, well, they're not supposed to be there, yet they are. And I just, I don't know, I think, I think army bases being in other parts of this world, other than on American soil, are a curse upon, uh, upon humanity. And for what? For what? For, for what is all this happening for? And the only thing that I can conclude is that it's greed, you know? Thank you so much.